So today, as we begin, um, I want you to know that um, our pastoral staff, your pastoral staff, is extremely talented. Now, you might already know this, but I want to emphasize it this morning. I would go so far to say that that several of the pastors on our self are, are on our staff are experts, maybe even specialists in their area of expertise. As a matter of fact, I believe that their area of expertise could be beneficial for you. Uh, Let me just give you a a couple of examples today. So uh, if you sit back and say, man, in 2018, I want to learn to dress really cool. Um, As the millennials would say, uh, you want to make sure that your clothes are snatched. That's a phrase that I just learned this week. Then Pastor Brad Creviston is your man. And so whether it's, whether it's, you know, tucking his jeans inside his boots, whether it's, you know, wearing the ripped jeans or uh, wearing that famous Christmas suit that he does every year, Brad can pull it off, can he not? He does a fantastic job. So that's not all. So let's say this year you say, I want to learn to ride a motorcycle. I mean, I really want to learn to ride a motorcycle and be able to, you know, be able to hit the open road and and ride a motorcycle. Stephen Dennis is your guy. Stephen is a motorcycle man. Now, he tells me he's a motorcycle man. I kind of wonder why his motorcycle is inside. That's in our building. So maybe he's been riding his motorcycle around in our building during the week. So let's say this year that uh, you want to learn how to dance salsa. I mean, you want to really learn how to tear it up on the dance floor, then Jose Santiago is your man. I don't know if you remember, a few years ago we did this video, I think it was uh, Peanut Butter and Jelly, I don't know if you remember that, and so uh, part, of the, part of the video was that all of us pastors were supposed to get up and we were supposed to dance Peanut Butter and Jelly time, and I did it, and uh, it was quite embarrassing, you can find it on YouTube, and Thomas Miller was here then, Thomas did it, Brad did okay, but Jose knocked it out of the park, man. I'm telling you, if you want to learn how to dance, Jose is your man. And so finalizing our pastoral staff, if you want to do repairs around your house, I'm talking about creatively building things and transforming your backyard into a tropical paradise, then Vicki Burkholder is the person that you want to learn from. It's not me, you know that, it's her. And by the way, that is her tool belt and that is her toolbox, all right? You go to our house, I have a toolbox, but it's empty. If we want tools, we go to Vicky's toolbox. The simple truth is this, all of us need to learn from others, do we not? All of us need, to, need experts in our life that teach us and show us the way to go. So so our theme this year as we begin 2018, very first Sunday of the year, and I'm so glad you're here on the first Sunday, our theme for 2018 is live generously. You can see that, and we've said it the last couple of weeks, and we're going to continue to say it. We want that theme to guide our ministry this year. But we not only want that theme to guide our ministry, we want that theme to give direction to our lives. I don't want that theme to be Hollywood Community Church's theme or or, or, or motto or whatever it is. I want it to be your theme this year. It's not only the theme of Hollywood Community Church, but it's the theme of the Burkholder family. Live generously. And I want it to be the theme of your family as well. As such, that goal should permeate every area of your life, every area of my life. And quite frankly, let's be honest, such a mindset does not come easy, does it? It's, a, it's counter-cultural. Because in our culture, it's all about us. It's all about satisfying our needs. It's all about satisfying our wants. It's all about putting us first. And that is not the truth of the gospel, And that is not the way that Jesus lives and lived. And so, if you want to live in a generous way, a way of frequently, sacrificially, and liberally helping others, then Jesus Christ is the person that you need to emulate. 
And Jesus Christ is the person that I need to emulate, the person from whom we must learn. He is the supreme expert on generous living. So having said that, turn in your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. The next four weeks, we will discover what it means to live generously just as Jesus did. And so, in Philippians chapter 1 and then into Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul unpacks for us what it means to live a generous life. And, and uh, I don't want you to get scared today. We're not going to talk about giving four weeks. As a matter of fact, we're not going to talk about giving at all. Living a generous life is not about giving. It's about living in a way that, that I live out the truth of the gospel in my life. And so Philippians chapter 1, we'll put the verses up on the screen, follow along. Verse 27, Paul says this, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let me just pause there for a second. If you're looking for a goal for this year, if you haven't made a New Year's resolution this year, I cannot think of any better New Year's resolution than for your life, as Paul says, to be lived worthy of the gospel. Paul says, so that whether I come and see you or an absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm, notice this, firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened in anything by your opponents, for that is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that for God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake." engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Paul, as he wrote this, was in prison. Chapter 2, verse 1, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Notice verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Verse 4 is going to be our theme verse for the year. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Would you pray with me today? Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we've had to meet together. It might be cold outside, but it's warm in here. Thank you for brothers and sisters and family in Christ that we're able to come and lay aside the pressures and the stresses of life and we're able to focus our attention on Jesus and love one another. So Lord, as we look at this truth today, I pray that, that you would drive the truth home. Help us to understand and comprehend and put in practice what it means to live generously. Help us to follow this year the example of Jesus Christ in our lives, in our families, and in our church, in our community. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as I mentioned, over the next four weeks, we will discover what it truly means to live generously. Let me start because we want to define what that means, all right? So you're going to hear us use that phrase over and over again through the year. Let me define what generous living is. It's in your outline. We've defined it this way. Generous living is to live your life selflessly and sacrificially for the benefit of others. Would you, would you read that definition with me today? So, so let's all say it together. I want it to come out of your mouth as well, all right? So let's read it together. Generous living is to live your life selflessly and sacrificially for the benefit of others. And as I mentioned, we're going we're gonna to walk through Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to unpack four key components in Philippians chapter 2 that will enable us individually and corporately as a church to live generously. Today we're going to see the fact that unity is the foundation of generous living. Next week we'll see that humility 
is the requirement of generous living. Then we'll see that mission is the goal of generous living. And then I want us to see that multi-ethnicities and multi-generations united and ministering together is the result of generous living. So this year, we not only want to understand what it means to live generously, but we want to actually live generously as a congregation, as families, and as individuals. So in these verses, by way of introduction, Paul says just a couple of really simple truths that I kind of want to flesh out and unpack and for us to understand today. So if you're following along in your outline, the very first thing that Paul says is this. He says, adversity brings unity. Adversity brings unity. I simply mean, Paul simply means that personal struggles, health battles, financial crisis, and maybe even worldly rejection as a believer should unify us together as a faith family. And so when we go through struggles, those struggles should not divide us. Rather, those struggles should better and more strongly unite us. That is what Paul states in today's passage. Let me flesh it out in two ways. The first thing I wrote down in my notes is this. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have been granted the privilege to suffer. Let me say it again. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have been granted the privilege to suffer. Now, as you hear that, I can certainly understand what your reaction might be. You might be saying or thinking, what? (laughs) What are you talking about, Brian? That as followers of Jesus Christ, we have been given the privilege of suffering. I know that statement sounds ludicrous. You might even be questioning in, in, in in your mind, you might even question, who in their right mind would consider suffering a privilege? As a matter of fact, if I asked you today, many of us probably did New Year's resolutions. If I asked you, you know, to raise your hand or to share what your New Year's resolution is for this year, I would venture to say that there's not a single one of us here today that would say, I'd like to suffer this year. I mean, this is the year that I'd like to lose my job. Or this is the year that I would like to have cancer. Or this is the year that I would like to have a financial crisis. Or whatever it is. No one desires to suffer. It's not something that we desire. And so from a human perspective, it makes no sense to state that suffering is a privilege. But I want you to see Paul's statement in verse 29. I think we'll put it up on the screen again. Paul says, and and, and kind of notice the words, Paul says, for it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but that you should also suffer for his sake. Keep it up there for a second. The word granted, that, 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 that might just seem like a normal word to you, but let me tell you what that word is in the original language. You know the New Testament was written in Greek. It wasn't written in English. That word granted comes from the Greek word charis. It's the word from which we get our word Grace. It's the exact same word that is found in Ephesians 2, 8, where Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace, we understand, is something that God gives us freely, something that we do not deserve, something that is what? For our benefit. Same word. Paul says, for God has graciously granted you the privilege not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Paul alludes to the same privilege in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 2, where Paul, making that desire known, he says, that I may know him. And Paul says, here's what I want to know. I want to know the power of his resurrection. Then he makes this wild statement, that I might share in his sufferings becoming like him in his death. So here's the question that I worked out in my mind and my heart this week, because I get it. How in the world can suffering be beneficial? If I looked at you today and I said, boy, God's gonna bless you this year, and here's how God's gonna bless you. God's gonna allow, allow you to go through the deepest trial of your life. Or God's gonna allow you to struggle in a way that you have never struggled before. 
you would sit back and say, Brian, that doesn't make any sense. How in the world can that be beneficial to me? Well, it certainly is not beneficial in its immediate effect. Suffering hurts, does it not? Suffering is painful. No one wants to go through suffering. But Paul is talking about suffering's long-term effect on your life and on mine. Let, let me illustrate, simple illustration. So, so 19 years ago, I had a heart attack. And I subsequently, after my heart attack, I had triple bypass open heart surgery. It took me like a month to recover or something like that. You might sit back and say, oh my word, Brian, as you look back on that, that must be horrific. Let me make a wild statement. Today, I thank God for my heart attack and for my subsequent open heart surgery. You say, Brian, why is that? Because I'm alive today because of that. You see, I had an uncle who had a heart attack at 37 and he's dead. I had a cousin who had a heart attack at 32 and he's dead. <laughs> and I can go back now and say, man alive, yeah, that was painful. That, that was traumatic. That, that, that was something that I don't want to go through again. But guess what? It worked out for my good. I now have a cardiologist who meets me every three months. I do a stress test all the time. He looks at me and says, Brian, you know what? We're going to monitor you. We're going to make sure that never happens to you again. And so I look at something that was traumatic for me, and I look back on it and say, wow, I'm so grateful that happened to me. Follow my thinking today in a similar way. In a similar way, even though it's difficult for us to comprehend how suffering can benefit us, suffering helps to put our life in focus. Suffering knocks off the, the rough edges, and it teaches us to live life in a way that God intended for us to live. And so no one would say going through suffering, as Peter says, man, suffering is joyful for the moment. But Paul says, God has granted to you. God has granted to you the privilege to not only believe, and it's really interesting the way he grammatically plays that out, because he places believing and suffering on the exact same level. All of us would sit back in today and today and say, man, we believe. That is a, a grace that God has given to us, the grace to believe in him. And Paul says, if God's given you the grace to believe, he's also given you the grace to suffer. So I have no idea what God's going to do in your life this year. I would, through experience, sit back and say, some of us are going to lose a family member this year. Some of us are going to go through a traumatic illness. Some of us are going to go through relationship issues. Some of us are going to lose a job. Some of us are going to have a financial crisis. Here's what Paul says. Even in those moments, God is being gracious to you. He has granted to you the privilege to suffer for his sake. There's a second thing that he says in the passage, and this is where Paul is going. He says, secondly, that as followers of Jesus Christ, we need each other more when we suffer. We need each other more during the bad times than we do during the good times. That's the actual premise of what the Apostle Paul is saying in this passage. Think with me. You'll get this. Advantage tends to make us independent of each other while adversity tends to make us dependent upon each other or on each other. Does that make sense? Advantage, whenever things are going good, food in the refrigerator, money in the bank, in the savings account, 401k is growing, I got a job, I got a wife that loves me, my kids are healthy. Advantage tends to make us independent. We got this. We don't need anything else. But adversity demonstrates our frailty. Adversity demonstrates that we need one another. We see that truth illustrated every time we go through a hurricane here in South Florida. 
When life is good, we have very little interaction with our neighbors, as I do. You might go outside and say hello to your neighbor. Hey, Junior. <laughs> hey, Dave. How you doing? Everything good? We might have interaction with our neighbors. We say hello. But when the hurricane hits, we transform from acquaintances to partners. Do we not? We now need one another. And all of a sudden, the people to whom we have just said hello are now the people we're knocking on the door saying, hey, would you help me put up my shutters? You help me put up my shutters, I'll help you put up your shutters. What happens? Adversity brings us together. Adversity causes us to see our need for unity. That's what Paul is saying in the passage. Adversity does the same thing for believers. Adversity unites us. I read this week a statement that just really impacted me, and it's still bouncing around in my head just a little bit, but I I read this statement from an author that was talking about the church in countries where Christians have experienced a lot of persecution. And this author made this statement about those countries and Christians in those countries. I think we have it up on the screen. He says this, when the doors of North Korea, China, and Cuba finally open, the world will be blown away by the size, the strength, and the unity of the churches in those countries. Now you and I would sit back and think, oh my word, persecution would, would hinder unity. It would, it would stifle the growth of the church. It would hinder believers from coming together. But history proves otherwise. Adversity grows the church. Adversity unifies the body of Christ. Adversity strengthens the body of Christ. We might not see it yet in our country, but it's being demonstrated in countries where Christians are persecuted all around the world. And I'd encourage you to read about the persecuted church, how in China, believers have to meet together at one in the morning with no lights on, singing very softly to not draw attention to themselves. And you sit back and think, who in the world would go to church at one in the morning with the lights off? By the thousands, by the tens of thousands, they are doing that. Why? Adversity brings unity. It helps us to realize our need. You see, it's in the midst of persecution during the times of suffering. The little things no longer bother us. I'd venture to say that the people in China don't get upset over little things, you know, you know the color of the auditorium, service change times. They don't get bothered by any of that. It's no longer important to them. We reach a point where we simply need one another. That's what Paul is saying in the passage. Adversity brings unity. So let me just pause for a second and say this. I want you to know this. Whatever you go through this year, we're here for you. If you lose a family member, we're here for you. If you lose a job, we're here for you. If you need a friend, we are here for you. That's what a church family is. That's what a church family does. That's what we want to be. We want to live generously this year. Paul says says a second thing. Paul says this, not only does adversity bring unity, but Paul says that community strengthens unity. That's actually what he says in the beginning of chapter two. Let me remind you, you probably know this, that when the Bible was written, there were no chapter divisions. So we look, the chapter one ends, and Paul talks about suffering, and he says that you're engaged in the same battle than I am. We see period, and we think, okay, Paul ends his thoughts, and now he goes on to another thought. Originally, there were no chapter divisions, so Paul says at the end of verse of chapter one, I'm engaged or you're engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. He says, so, connecting verb, so, is there any encouragement in Christ? Is there any comfort from love? Is there any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy? 
Those are phrases that Paul uses to describe the believer's ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. He uses four suppositional phrases to communicate that truth. There's actually two parallel sections. The first and the third phrases speak of objective facts. All right, yes, yeah, yes, there is encouragement in Christ. Yes, there is participation in the Spirit, objective facts. The second and the fourth phrases are subjective. They talk about subjective emotions. Is there then any comfort of love? Because of your encouragement in Christ, do you feel love? That's what Stephen sang about today, this reckless love of God that he demonstrates for us. So because of that relationship, do you feel love? Because of the participation in the Spirit, do you feel affection? Do you feel uh, sympathy? So, so, so here's the gist of what Paul is saying. If you're following along in your outline, Paul is saying that your unity with Christ should result in your unity with others. Your unity with Christ should result, the natural response to being united with Christ is to being united with my brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, here's what he says, simple terms. Let me whittle it down to the smallest common denominator. It's Jesus who brings us together. That's who brings us together. How how else could a snatchy-dressing pastor from South Florida, a motorcycle-riding pastor from Georgia, a salsa-dancing pastor from Puerto Rico, and a mechanically inept pastor from Ohio come together and love each other and function together and serve each other? You might say, well, you guys are just great guys. We are great guys. But that's not what it is. It's Jesus who unites us. We have Jesus in common. Simple illustration today. So so let's suppose that a man that I don't like, all of us have people in our lives that we don't like. So all of a sudden there's this guy that I don't like. Every time I see him coming, I want to go the other way. This man that I don't like comes up and he says this, Brian, can I see pictures of your granddaughters? Hey, hey. I'm going to show my enemies pictures of my granddaughters, right? So I pull out my phone and I start showing this guy that I don't like, that I don't want to talk to, that I don't want to spend time with. I start showing him pictures of my granddaughters. And he starts looking at them and saying, man, they are absolutely gorgeous. And I'm like, yeah, they are. Man, they're the cutest thing in the world. And I'm like, yeah, they are. Which one you think looks like me? Which one you think looks like Vicky? All of that. And then he starts asking me questions about my granddaughters. And all of a sudden, I start thinking, this guy isn't near as bad as I thought he was. <laughs> Man, I disliked this guy for a long time. But you know what? Anybody who likes my granddaughters has to be a pretty cool guy, has to be a pretty great guy. So all of a sudden, here's this guy that I didn't like, that we had nothing common with. And all of a sudden, we found something that united us. We found three little precious, and I should have taken the opportunity to put their picture up on the screen, and I didn't do that. Three little precious girls did what? They united these two guys that had nothing in common. Church, listen. That's exactly what Jesus does to us. He tears down the walls that divide us And he unites us together as a congregation. Paul says this in verse 2. He says, complete my joy, being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Just as Paul used four phrases in verse 1, he uses four phrases in verse 2. And he used four phrases that are basically saying the exact same thing. Here's what he says. Let me summarize it. Because you are going to suffer, because of your relationship in Jesus Christ that you have, you should be united, same mind, same love, being in accord with one another of the same mind. Once again, it's Jesus who unites us. So, so, So here's what I said in my notes, and I really want you to catch this. You've probably heard this before, but I really want you to catch this. So so, so here's what Paul is saying. The gospel 
demands unity, but it does not demand uniformity. I want to flesh that out in just a second, but Paul is saying that the gospel demands unity, not uniformity. Uniformity is the idea that we all have to be alike. We have to, we have to like the same things. We have to vote alike. We have to dress alike. We have to like the same music. We have to eat the same food. We have to come from the same background. Shoot, we got we to gotta cheer for the same sports teams. We got to all be alike. I've been, uh, years ago when I was in college, uh, I traveled in the singing group and we went into churches all over the country and I remember going in this one church, and I, I'm not exaggerating, I went in this one church that it had a picture. You walked in the foyer and right in the front there was a picture that said, men, if you're going to attend our church, here's the way your hair should be cut. Everybody had to taper their, I mean, it was, it was the, the old days. Basically, they were saying to attend our church, you gotta be just like us. We all gotta look alike, think alike, talk alike, dress alike. Let me say this very clearly. You will never find that in scripture. Never find it in scripture. It wasn't that way in the church of Philippi. Go back to Acts chapter 16 and you'll see that the church of Philippi was made up of a group of extremely diverse people. The, Luke tells us in Acts chapter 16 that, that, that there was a, an Asian lady in the church named Lydia, seller of purple. She was from Asia. And then, and then Paul talks about the Roman jailer that was in there who was, who was from Italy, who was a, a European. So we see ethnic diversity within the church. And, the, and then, then Paul talks about slaves in the church and free people in the church and, and rich people in the church and poor people in the church. Here's what Paul it was demonstrating, that the church of Philippi, our church, any church, should be incredibly diverse. It's not uniformity. Could you imagine if all of a sudden I said, okay, guys, here's the deal. Dr. Hill and I wear sweater vests all the time. We want every man wearing sweater vests. Now, Mike and I would agree, if you want to be handsome, wear a sweater dress, right, Mike? I mean, just like Mike, he wears those tight sweater vests that kind of pop out his chest and shows his pectoral muscles. Yeah, I think he intentionally buys sweater vest one size too small just to be able to do that. I put on a sweater vest one size too small, and for some reason it doesn't accentuate this, it accentuates this right here. <laughs> What if we said that? That would be crazy. What if we said, man, to attend here, here's the type of music you gotta listen to. Or to attend here, you gotta think, Brian's a better preacher than Brad, or Brad's a better preacher than Brian, or, 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 or whatever it is. That would be absolutely crazy. That's not what the Bible demands. The Bible demands, the gospel demands unity, not uniformity. So, so, so let me just, I know I'm gonna roll the last couple of weeks of just saying just things directly. So let me say some things really directly today. We don't want a church at Hollywood Community Church of just Republicans or just Democrats or just independents. We want people to realize that no matter what your pillar political affiliation is, you are welcome at Hollywood Community Church and you are welcome to the body of Christ. We don't want a church made up of just white people or just black people or just Hispanic people or just purple people for that matter. We don't want that at our church. We don't want a church just made up of old people or just made up of young people. We don't want a church made up of people who just like contemporary music or people who just like traditional music. Here's what we want. We want a church of radically diverse people, yet a church that is radically and deeply unified. Why is that? Why is that? Because that's the way heaven's going to be. That's the way Jesus is. Jesus doesn't look at you and say, man, you know what, in order for me to love you, you gotta change political parties. Or in order for me to love you, you know what, you gotta put on long sleeves. I don't wanna see those tattoos on your arms. Or in order for me to love you, here's the way that you have to dress. 
The gospel doesn't do that. Listen, church, catch this. This is so very important. The more we become like each other, the less attractive we are to the world. If the world looks at us and says, my word, everybody in that place is all of the same ethnicity, or everybody in that place dresses alike, talks alike, I'm not like them. We're what? We're no longer attractive to a lost world. It is unity in the midst of diversity that is attractive to the world. That's why Jesus looks at the disciples and says, you know how people are gonna know that you're my disciples? If you love one another. You're able to crow across the aisle and you're able to hug somebody who thinks different than you. You're able to go across the aisle and you're able to hug somebody who votes differently than you. You're able to go across the Bible, the, the aisle of somebody who likes different music than you or eats different food than you. Unity in diversity is attractive. Unity in diversity is the gospel. Now, it doesn't mean we water down what we believe. It doesn't mean we change our doctrinal beliefs, but we live out the truth of the gospel. So, so, so let me, my time's up. I want to give you four ways, four ways to develop unity, practical. This is, this is something to put in your pocket and to think about and meditate on and to examine in your life and mine. So the first thing is this, realize that you are part of a faith family. You're part of a faith family. Look at the person beside you if they're not related to you. Look at the person beside you and say, we're family. Would you do that? We're family. Now, it's easy for you to do that if your wife's beside you, or, or, or in Vicky's case, if her sister, her mom, her dad, and her brother are beside her. It's easy to do that. But, but, but it's difficult to do that if somebody's beside you who is radically different than you. And, and yet, church, I would say this. The spiritual bonds which bind us are stronger with, than the biological bonds which bind us. We are family. Would you say that with me today? We are family. Say it again. We are family. So you know what that means? As family, sometimes we put up with each other's junk, doesn't it? Now, let me just qualify. I am not saying that because my in-laws are here. I am not saying that because they're here. Man, we have patience with family. Man, we go to our family reunion, even though there's somebody there that we don't like, and we, and we put up with them. Why? Because we're family. Realize you are part of a family. I love that song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. You're part of a family. Let me give you a second practical truth. All right? Be quick to forgive and slow to hold a grudge. Be quick to forgive and slow to hold a grudge. Sometimes as believers, man, we, we invert that, do we not? We're really slow to forgive, and we're very quick to hold a grudge. We're very quick to get upset at somebody who doesn't do something like we do, somebody who responded incorrectly to us, somebody who didn't treat us the way that we deserve to be treated. Listen, sit back and be reminded each and every day of the patience and the grace that God demonstrates in your life and my life every single day. I'm forgiven today, not because I deserve it, I'm forgiven today because there's a God in heaven because of Jesus who is quick to forgive me. And when I fall on my knees and say, man, God, forgive me, I responded incorrectly today. God doesn't look down to me and say, man, you did that yesterday. Come on, Brian. He's quick to forgive. James says this in James chapter one and verse 19, he says this, James 1, 19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Once again, if we're not careful, we invert that. We're, uh, we're, we're very slow to hear, we're very quick to speak, and we're very quick to get 
angry. Let's not do that. As brothers and sisters of Christ, let's be patient with one another. Let's, let's love one another. Or, all right, let's, let's, let's not allow little things to divide us. We have an enemy who would love nothing more than to sow seeds of division. Uh, that, that's what he would like to do in your family and our church. Let's not allow him to do that. Let me show you a third thing. A third way that you can develop unity is this. Learn to do life together with others in a life group. I, I can't, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot emphasize the importance of this. When you come here, you're a number. I get it. We have 400 people in here. All right, that's not a huge church, but it's a large enough church. You can come in. You can be anonymous. You can sit in the front row or the back row, and you can leave, and you're not connected whatsoever. We want you to be connected. And we want you to be connected not just to me. You might say, well, hey, I know Brian, and Brian knows me. Great. What happens if God takes Brian home tomorrow? You gotta be connected to a body. Brad's gonna be, I think Brad's gonna be in the back afterward. If you're not part of a life group, we want you to be a part of a life group. Join one, start one. Get four or five couples together and start one and begin to meet together and pray together and do life together. Get to know each other, open up, share your fears, share your struggles, pray for one another. Join a life group, I promise you. It's going to be to your benefit. And the last thing is this. The, this year, let me encourage you to pray John 17, 20 through 23 on a regular basis. That's Jesus' high priestly prayer. I want to put up on the screen, let's read it so you see it. And I, 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 I know we're not Jesus. I'm not saying that, but, but, but pray the gist of this. Jesus praying to the Father and says, I don't ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be, what does he say? One. One. Just as you, Father, and me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So here's Jesus before he ever went to the cross, praying for what? Praying for the unity of believers. Verse 22, the glory that you have given to me, I have given to them that they may be, what? One, even as we are one. Verse 23, I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. You, you know why many people don't wanna become believers? Don't wanna become followers of Christ? It's because of us. It's because of believers who act like unbelievers in the face of unbelievers who act more like believers. And I've heard so many people say over and over again, why would I want to be a part of something where people are biggering, they're arguing over silly little things? Why would I want to be a part of that? And Jesus sat back and he prayed, Oh, Father, make them one. Unite them together. Make them one. Why? So that the world may believe that you sent me. There is no greater testimony of the gospel to the world than diverse people who think differently, act differently, vote differently, eat differently, coming together, locking arms, saying because of Jesus, we are one. So church, what does it mean to live generously? We talk about generous living, what does that mean? It means for the sake of the gospel, we put aside our differences. For the sake of the gospel, we put aside our offenses. For the sake of the gospel, because of our relationship with Jesus, because of how he treats us, we treat others the same way, not because they deserve it, but because of Jesus. He is the one who unites us. Let's live generously.